God bless. Thank you all for joining us today. God bless uh, for another day that we are here today and we're to join ourselves in the Lord. And I, God, I was, I was uh, studying on a couple of weeks ago, and God laid something on my heart that I wanted to talk about. And the subject of it tonight is a church without walls. And I want you all to think about that for a moment, uh, of what a church without walls may look like in the 21st century. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. But I want you to look at our scripture verse if you, while I'm praying um, to go to Matthew, the 28th chapter, uh, starting at the 16th to the 20th verse. And that's going to be our scripture reading for the day, where we're uh, going to be getting our uh, text and background and everything from. So uh, while I'm praying, if you have time to, to re get your Bibles or your handouts, please do so. Um, Father, we thank you, Lord, for another day. We thank you that you have been so good. We thank you that you have opened up the way and you have made ways out of no way. Lord, we know that you are the great provider, Jehovah Yaira, and we know that you can do all things. And we pray, Lord, that you will meet the needs for everyone on this call, Heavenly Father. We ask you, Lord, to just strengthen them while they go through their situations or their turmoils or their trials or their tests. Lord, let them see you in everything and let them give you glory. Let them worship and praise you in spite of, because we know that you are worthy to be praised in all things. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless your name. Lord, we ask you to decrease us in this discussion and increase your Holy Spirit in us, that the words that we talk about and the words that we express encourage, uplift, and edify as anyone that may hear or see these words of discussion. We bless your name and we thank you for all things. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So those of you that are, are that have Matthew the 28th, 16th to the 20th, um, I just want you to go ahead and and kind of think about that verse or read it while I'm going through my introduction. What does the church without walls look like? It is defined, is it defined by the absence of a building structure or is it something else? When we say without walls, we should consider it as a church, its congregational character and acceptance of people who come to fellowship within the walls of the structure. The church walls reveals to them how they love and have empathy for each other in the spirit of the agape love. The church is then considered to be a lighthouse for the abandoned and broken vessels trying to get home. What the disciples initiated after the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of the commission to go into the streets go to meetings, and go wherever there was an opportunity to, to talk about the gospel of Jesus' resurrection and redemption. This is the beginning foundation of what a church without walls look like. A church without walls allows others to feel comfortable and safe in their fellowship. It allows the Holy Spirit to express edification, uh, correction, and teaching to those that are, are and, and, is, and desire to be receptive to his spirit. However, when we think of a church without walls, let's define the definition of what a wall is. The definition of wall means to enclose, shut off, divide, protect, border, to seal or fill. These are verbs according to the dictionary and are considered action words used with an object. 
Therefore, if we are a church and a body of believers and the actions of our church show signs of a wall, how does that church follow the Great Commission and the examples of the disciples? A church without walls should not mean we do not need leadership or accountability. It should mean the opposite. A church or community of called out believers should have structure and organization. The apostles in the book of Acts were all about organization and structure. But more importantly, it was imperative that everyone shared and loved each other without prejudice or deceit. Today, we must take the words of Jesus seriously when he said that a church divided or a house divided will fall. We need to be accountable to the God, our creator, to the word of God, which is Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, that we are guided and instructed in the ways that pleases him. We must be aware as believers in Christ not to exhibit a members only club mentality or by invitation only a feeling when someone visits and or have an elitism ideology about our faith. Remember what Jesus said and how he lived when he said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If we are a church, that is defined as having emotion and empathetic walls to embrace and maintain a God love to those who fellowship with us, then we are truly a church that's called out and not a social club. Amen. I know some of us uh, um, have probably looked at the, the Great Commission that I asked you all to turn your, your, the Bibles to or your handout to, which it says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. So that's the, 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 the crust of what we're going to talk about today, uh, church without walls. You know, uh, we've heard the, the saying and we've heard the phrase, you know, we are a church without walls. We are a church that every, you know, we are a church. We don't need to be enclosed in the four corners. I've even said that to myself until the Lord had to kind of correct me on, on that. You know, uh, I might not have the four corners of the wall, and I might not have the structure with the 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 pews and the pew pit and, and the choir stand and offering plate and the tide box. I might not have all of those things, but there's a certain thing that comes with uh, being a church and being a church without walls. Like in my introduction, we are to have a, a leadership and accountability. And that's important because we are, uh, we are, we are, I, I, I'm trying to find the right word. I'm not gonna say we are uh, in charge of people that come up under us, but we are, in, we are protective or overseers of their souls. So when we or others come to fellowship with us, it is our mandate as leaders to, to be overseers of their soul, or to make sure that they're being fed the word of God, make sure that they're being led and accountable the right way, regardless if you have walls or you don't have walls. You know, there's a lot of people, including myself, that have chosen to uh, communicate and 
give a word and to reach out to people that's in the social media and electronic atmosphere and the social networking because it's, it's, in my opinion, it's easier to reach out and expound and exhort the word of God through through social media as opposed to meeting in the four corners of, the, of a church. And the reason why that is, is the more more or less is, is quite frankly, you know, it's building. You, you, you might not have money for a building. You might not have enough members to sustain uh, the building maintenance or the building uh, uh, responsibilities that you might need. Or you might not even know the structure of whatever edifice that you want to have. But in some cases, and it might be more than others, Maybe God didn't call you to have a structure. Maybe God called you to, to legitimately have a church without walls, in meaning that you are the leader, you are the pastor, and those that join in every week or come to, to fellowship with you, you know, you are accountable to their souls, uh, accountable to God about their souls because you are teaching them, you are leading them, you are feeding them, you are encouraging them, you are strengthening them. So that's the role of of what a pastor does, whether it's with or without walls. So I wanted to kind of clarify that because those things are very germane to what the Great Commission entails because it Great Commission says go. It didn't say go and build a structure. It didn't say go and find a synagogue. It didn't say go and uh, have church in your home. It didn't say any of those things. It just said one general command, go. And therefore, and, uh, and, and, preach, and teach and preach the gospel. You know, and, and that's what... Um, and I'm sorry, I said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So when we are going forth and we are making disciples, we have to have an avenue or engine in order to do that. Now, I know what a lot of people say, well, you know, you got people running around, they, they call themselves pastors and they ain't been called and they call themselves preachers and they don't know nothing about the word of God and, and who ordained them and who, you know, who's their overseer. And, you know, we got all of those protocols in place for accountability. And that is, that is absolutely correct. And that is absolutely what, you know, the church of today and the tradition and and the ritual and the uh, doctrine uh, states that needs to be done, you know, but does that negate a person that God has given them something to say, that God has uh, put in their heart to say or a message to give in relation to the Great Commission? You know, do you wait for that that structure? Do you wait for that pastor? Do you wait for that church that you done served in for 15, 20 years or 30 years to say, okay, it's time for you, you know, to go to next that next step? But God had told you 10 years ago, you know, that I have a I have a I have a purpose for you. Uh brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. I have a, uh, a plan for you, you know, and, and it, so I want you to go over here and the message that I give you, these are the people that need to receive it. So when you hear that, and it's in the same alignment with the Great Commission, what do you do? I mean, do you say, well, I'm going to ask the pastor, is that okay for me to do that? Well, sure, you should if you're under that accountability of who he is. You should. And the correct thing to do is ask. And uh, if it it, hopefully, you know, they will give you their blessing to to go and do what God had called you to do. But if not, you know, that that's where the the conundrum come in or the, the the the. the uh, the fork in the road comes in. That do you listen to God or do you hope that man would see what God has shown you and revealed to you? 
Now, I know that that's a touchy subject for so many of us because we have to make that decision. Are we going to listen to God and allow God to strengthen us as we walk forward in the Great Commission and to elevate us through the Holy Spirit? Now, that's important. You need to have the Holy Spirit. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you where that comes in at. If we turn your Bibles to Acts, the second chapter, beginning at the first to the ninth verse. Um, but I think I'm going to only start, I'm only going to stop at the fourth verse. But you can read for your own from the first to the ninth and say, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all on one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rush of mighty wind, and it filled the whole house, and they were sitting where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of the other. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now, that's the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that connects us to the message and the relation and the, the obedience under God. That means that we're not out there just doing whatever we want to do and just preaching what they call in the Bible strange doctrines or, or, or strange gospels or tickling ears and everything. So see, there's an order we have to have those things. I know a lot of people have been in, in church for years and they've heard this and they've, they've understood it to be what it is. But uh, what I want to talk about is the church without walls. And the reason why I set all of these things up, because there is a such thing as being a church without walls. And I'm not talking about that structure, what we just talked about. We're going to move forward to the other uh, the dynamics of what a church without walls is. And this is where I want to kind of stay with. Uh, the church without walls, like we read, the definition is enclosed, shut off, divide. They put, it's a wall protects, it's a border. It's uh, to seal or fill. Now, when we are believers in Christ, when we are a fellowship, uh, believers, when people come to us, do we have our wall up? Do we have a wall that prevents a person that's coming off the street to feel love, to feel the connection, to feel the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit that's flowing in our congregation? See, because to enclose, to shut off means our wall as a fellowship, our wall as a body of believers, when someone comes off the street that may be, you know, identified of somebody working in the works of the flesh. And uh, when they come through the door, you know, they might not look like us. They might not sound like us. They might not even dress like us or, or they might not even smell like us. But what do you do? as believers in your church, in your, in your building, in your fellowship, where you come every Sunday. Now, everyone in the church now, all of us, we have our suits on, we have our ties on. The women, they have their hats on and they look, you know, prestigious and everybody clean. Everybody come there because they presenting their best to the Lord for that day. And that's great. But if somebody comes through that door that may not have their best or their best isn't your best, their best is probably what they had on for the last week. And they may not have had a bath and they may not have had hygiene or grooming, but they come through those doors. Do you look at them sideways? Do you look at them in a way where it makes them feel uncomfortable? Do you shut off the love so when you don't have walls, see, th then it's a different story. See, when they come through that door, then you, you're looking at them with empathy. You're looking at them with love. You're looking at them with grace and, and mercy because, you know, they done been through some things. 
<laughs> and see, a lot of a lot of people say that the church is is like a, a, a lighthouse, and a church is like a, a a hospital. Everybody that's sick or broken, they could come there to be healed. Okay, if that's the case, if there if the church is so things and a broken and hurt person comes through those doors, you know, where's where's the fellowship? Where's that? That, that connection to where the Holy Spirit will reach out through you to help them. That's what we have to look at. We could have five, six, seven hundred people sitting in a congregation and, and believe it or not, they won't even speak to each other. They won't even talk or, or say, God bless you or good morning. I went to this one church in Georgia and I'm not going to say the name. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I went to this church and my wife and I, we went there. You know, we we followed a protocol. We had to have the suit on and my wife had to have her dress on and dress really nice because, you know, you want to match the audience that you're going into. Right. So you, you put all these things on because we want people to know, hey, you know, you got your best on. I got my best on. We all equal when we go to fellowship. You know, so, you know, we dress up, we put some smell good on and, and we on our way. We got our Bibles under our hand, under our arms and we we walk in a walk. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we put that for some that we put on that image, you know, so we're walking in there and, you know, as soon as we get to the door. Right. We say, oh, this is a beautiful place and it's a popular location in the we see the pastor on television, you know, and and and, and it, it, it's beautiful, you know. We get there, right? And we're walking in, and we see the usher. The usher says, "God bless you. We're so glad to see you. We're happy to see you." And some other people come, and they happy to see us. They was like, "Oh, we're so glad you can join us in fellowship with us, right?" And we was looking like. Wow, you know, because they didn't they didn't know us from Adam, but they embraced us. And before service started, they were talking, Oh, how are you? Do do you have your Bible? Are you okay? How did you hear about us? You know, it was it was a welcoming it's experiences. It was a welcoming feeling. And the one person said, oh, let me show you where the bookstore is. Let me show you where the prayer room is. Let me show you where after service, if you want to talk with the pastor, you can be right here, you know. And they gave us uh, uh, like we belong there or they wanted us to belong there, you know. And we were like, wow, this is nice. This is really nice. This is this is out of the ordinary from what we are used to, you know. Um, and that's unfortunate because if we are all in the body of Christ and we are all doing these things, then everyone should feel the fellowship and the warmth of the Holy Spirit when someone comes into anyone comes into your, your, your uh, like they say, your church or your edifice. Everyone should feel like they're wanted and they're needed to be there. Now, on the other hand, I went to another church, and when I got in, when me and my wife went in there, you know, people looked at us and rolled their eyes at us, and they were looking us up and down like, mm, I wonder what they got on, you know, and automatically, the spirit was quenched from us because we felt awkward. We felt like, okay, should we sit in the back, or should we just ease on back out the door, <laughs> You know, and during that time that we went to that church, uh, my wife and I, I had just had a battle with um, having, I almost threatened, I threatened a, a, a stroke and a heart attack at the same time. And I was in the hospital and they had to do an echocardiogram and everything. And thank God uh, he brought me through it. So I wanted to give God thanks, and I wanted to go and, and worship and praise him, and we decided to go to this church. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to get there, and the Lord's going to meet us there, and we're going to have a good old time, and that, you know, I could praise the Lord for, you know, healing my body in that instant that I didn't leave this earth. You know, it's something when you have a blood pressure of 120 over 111, 
and then your blood sugar level drops down to 75 at the same time. And that's a feeling that uh, is unimaginable because it's nothing you could do. And I remember that time because my wife, she went out and woke her up and told her what was going on. And we checked my vitals and everything. And sure enough, that was the case. And she started praying. She prayed like an old missionary that was about 75 years old. And I could feel those prayers. And if I couldn't feel them, I wanted to <laughs> because I didn't want to leave here. <laughs> I didn't want to leave here. I wasn't ready. <laughs> so I'm like, just a little more time, Lord, just a little more time. So, but God blessed us through it. And I'm able to laugh and praise God about it now. But at that time, that was scary business. That was scary business, not knowing if you're going to live or die that day. And so we went to this church and we walked in and it was cold. And, and it wasn't a, a, a chill as if they didn't know you. It was a chill as if, why are you here? What are you coming here for? You know, this is our church. If <laughs> this is what we do here, if you don't like it, you can leave. Or, you know, we felt those things and, and we felt as if they were summoning us up from head to toe to see if we was dressed accordingly to go inside of the church. Now, I, I've I know that there are rules and a lot of churches have rules of what you're supposed to wear. And some places say no pants. Men have to have suit jackets, uh, no skirts above the knees and no, no tight fitting dresses and all of those things, which I believe that is the order that you should have. But if somebody should come there, and if somebody should have those things on and that's all they have, what do you do? Do you turn them away or do you talk to them and still love on them and say, hey, come, come sit over here. Um, we know that you, you ain't dressed right now, but these are the rules and we still love you and we still want you to come. And so we want you to still have a good time. But see, that's not that doesn't have that can't be one person doing that. It has to be the whole congregation that's making that person not feel awkward. Now, you might have some people with with those, uh, you know, kind of like works of the flesh spirit that's coming there to try to tempt people. And, you know, those are different people and entities. But the Holy Spirit uh, uh, connect you to that person to tell that person, you know, in the spirit of love. <laughs> that they're out of order. And, it, you know, because a, a lot of people like to call those people the Jezebel spirits. And, you know, they are seducing spirits that comes through the, the, the sanctuary and through the church and, and, and they come to disrupt. It's just like there's the ball spirits that come to want to overtake and overthrow, you know. So we have to be cognizant of those things. I know I'm, I'm not going off the off the, the, the subject because I'm getting to a point about the church without walls. And see, all of us have to have those feelings of uh, not being enclosed and not closing ourselves off and not creating boundaries of things that we're going to feel and not feel when people come through the door. Because each church out there is the only Jesus that somebody may not may ever see. And it's important that if Jesus told us in his scriptures, the love thy neighbor as thyself and the greatest is love, you know, we have to find a way to show that regardless of who we may think we are in that church or in that auxiliary or what title we may have or how many years we sat there or we have an assigned uh, pew seat that we go sit down at every Sunday. That's my spot. And somebody comes there and take your spot and you have, you and literally tell them to get up out of your seat. Well, where's, where's the agape love at? <laughs> and let's talk about what agape love is. 
It goes beyond just the emotion and extent of seeking the best for others. That means that's the godly love. That's a love that that's like unconditional love. And I know it's hard for people to get to that uh, agape uh, standard because we're too busy working on a friendship. We're too busy working on the 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 intimate love and and the platonic love. But when we get to that that unconditional love, that means we have to have a Christ-like love that we are willing to go that extra mile for that person, the love on that extra person without having any prejudices against them. So, and that's that's what God wants us to know. God, that's what without walls, a church without walls is means we don't we don't have the separatism or the elitism or the feeling of a members only club. Now you 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 have to know. Now I you know you all can inbox me or comment me if you get a chance to. Have you ever ex- experienced a church that you went to where it really made you feel like you needed to be a member or you had to pay your membership in order to join? That meaning that once you got there and you decide you wanted to join a church and here you have a faction over there. You have a faction over there. You have you have factions everywhere separated within the body. Now, we're all supposed to be a collective community of believers that's called out. But yet you have Sister Majo and her clan over here and Brother Marbury over here with his group that only goes to golfing and they do that on their own over here. And then you have these other groups, They the females, they they go shopping on Sundays, but you can't come because you just join. <laughs> so how does that fit in the wall? Well, see, each one of them sections have like apartments inside the community and they have their little condos and everything. But here you come, you can't, you don't have enough rent. <laughs> I say you don't have enough rent to, to deal with all these structures. So then you start to feel outcast. Then you start to feel, you know, quenched because the, the, the excitement that you had for worshiping and serving the Lord has just been tainted because you see all these different little things going on inside the body. And it makes you question whether you're worthy to be, be, be in the presence of God, or if I have to be in the presence of God like that, or I have to get with a group or get with a clan or get with a clique in order to, to uh, be fed correctly or to fit in to the environment that I'm just walking into. So what do you do? Well, the Bible tells us that we... we we're, we're to leave those places. If peace don't abide, then you're supposed to shake the dust off your feet and, and take your peace back and leave. But sometimes we become subjugated into that situation to where we feel obligated. Or the pastor would say, well, you can't leave. And then that's a whole different thing because now you're, you're sealed into that wall. (laughs) You're sealed into there to the point where if you want to get fed, if you want to find Jesus, if you want to seek the Lord, you want to praise the Lord, all of those things are now bottled up into you. Now you have a wall within a wall within a wall. So we don't want to get to that place if we're believers in Christ. We want to be able to still feel as if we can fulfill the Great Commission which is to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when we come together as fellowship, when we come together as a body of believers, our mandate should be to train people to go. Our mandate should be to witness to people in fellowship and tell them how God has saved us and blessed us and and been there for us in the midst of our storms so that others can go out there and tell your testimony of the goodness of Jesus. But see, if we're we're so caught up in the 
politics and the protocol of what being in a, a four corner body establishment, a building established is, we miss the mark of showing others what love is and the fruits of the spirit. Now, let's talk about the fruits of the spirit. Now we have the commission and we know what a fellowship is. It's a friendly association. We identify what elitism is. That means everyone have uh, a little group or society that they feel that they're privileged to be in. And we have the wall. The wall is what shuts us off, what divides us, and what keeps us uh, sealed. You know, so we have these things. And we also talked about what agape love was, an unconditional love to love on people with a godly love, to be able to be there for them and to help them. So even when we're talking about what love is, Paul was really, really, really great at um, explaining what love is as far as for believers, as far as those in the body of Christ, those that uh profess salvation, those that have been born again. Um, this is what he says. Now, I want you to think about Paul and instance was, you know, he was a, he was a bad man at one time and he got converted on the road to Damascus and he became one of the apostles to preach to the Gentiles. So the Gentile structure is different than the, the Jewish structure and the way God uh, revealed himself uh, differently from the Jews and the Gentiles. So he utilized, he used Paul. And Paul had a lot of up, uphill battles to, to, to really contend with because he had to uh, preach to the people that are pagan, that had no idea who the God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. They had no idea. But Paul did a great job to show them that the God, the, what they knew of, the unknown God, was a God that loves and, and a God that would fill their hearts and their spirit with joy and a God that, that identifies love and love was more than, than sacrifice and love was more than the, uh, the natural things that they, they uh, were used to in their pagan ways. See, we have to be uh, cognizant that we cannot be pagan and Christian at the same time. It, it doesn't work like that. You could only be pagan, you could be pagan to convert to Christianity, but you can't be uh, Christian and pagan at the same time. More importantly, Paul wanted everyone to know that for believers, that we have to have love when people come to us. They might not know anything about what we're doing in that church or in their body of fellowship. They don't know Adam from Eve. I mean, nowadays it's different, but back then they didn't know any of that stuff. They knew what their own um, uh, beliefs were and their own belief system way back then were. But this is new wine and new wine skin for them. And they see the, the infilling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the change in the people that they knew. So that change that they saw was a loving change, a godly change, a change that showed that they were connected together in love. So this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and the 4th and the 8th verse. Now, see, these are things that's hitting on the, the characteristics of who they were or uh, the characteristics that they should have changed themselves from through the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, mind you, remember I said that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit has to indwell you and infill you for those changes to stick and take place. Now, every now and then you might you know, you might slip up or something and, and your Holy Spirit then took a break <laughs> temporarily, <laughs> you know, but that's why you go back to the church. That's why you go back to the fellowship to get that recharge and that reboot, you know, <laughs> and that's what, that's what we need a lot of times when we come to fellowship. We don't need all that drama and that soap opera stuff and all that other stuff that goes on uh, among each other. And 
what Paul did was interesting. He had to, you know, tell them the different characteristics that they should and um, should exhibit. And they may, they may not have understood it that well, but then most of them probably got it. Just like today, we could read the scripture, and, but are we actually doing it? Are we actually living out what these things, these characteristics that Paul is talking to the Corinthians about? Here it is. This is what he says. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, yeah, they're going to fail. Whether there are tongues, remember we talked about Pentecost and the tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it'll vanish away. So this is what Paul wanted to let them know. You know, these are the embodiments of what a Christian and what a believer in Christ should exhibit. Love is kind. When somebody comes into your, your sanctuary without walls, you will show them the love because your wall is not up to where you're guarded with, okay, who is that? What they come here for? I'm not going to give them a I'm not going to give them a hug. They don't smell right. They don't look right. Or, girl, I don't know who she is. <laughs> look at her hairstyle. You know, stuff like that. You know, they, they you putting that wall up <laughs> and, and, and you're making, you know, you're making it difficult to, to really uh, be kind <laughs> and, and to really do, to show the evidence. You know, when we are in that place, when we know that the Lord has changed us and renewed our minds and our hearts in Christ, and we feel the love of the Holy Spirit, there's no judgment there for us. There's no judgment that we should even think about doing to anyone because we are all sinners saved by grace. And yet some of us, I'm going to say some of us, might feel that need to say those things or feel those things. See, God sees your heart, whether you say it or not, because your expression, it's going to come out in your expression anyway. A lot of people can't play poker because they don't have a poker face and what they think will show in their faces. And when you are seeking and searching for answers and you're looking for healing and you're looking for uh, salvation, the first look that somebody give you can turn you away. The first feeling that that person don't want to hug you or not, not glad to see you can turn you around and make you go right back outside that door and say, why do I need to come to this church? This church, if, if they serve in a God that, and they act like this, I don't need to be here. And do you believe that there's so many people that have left the church that have been church hurt that have subjugated, been subjugated under church uh, in spiritual bondage because of the wall. The wall, meaning the, the, all of those things that prevented them, all of the walls that they put up that exacerbated the fact that they didn't want to love someone that came through that door. So the person felt that, and that person left. And what did they do? They continued with the works of the flesh. <laughs> and, you know, Paul, again, was gladly uh, to identify what those things were, too, because, see, he wanted to let them know that, okay, there has to be a paradigm shift in your life. There has to be a shift in your thought process. Now, we gave, I gave you what love is, those the, those are the things that are, are wonderful, you know. And but here, what the works of the flesh is that you might meet people coming into the church 
And if your walls are up, or if you feel like you're a social club and you're an elitist, then these people are going to connect with that because like, um, like Riley say on Boondocks, you know, game recognized game, Grandpa. And that's what it looks like and that's what it feels like when they come through that door. Now, these are the works of the flesh. Now, so many people are coming to the church because they want to be delivered from these things. But now you got all these things going on inside of your congregation, then they're going to say, well, <laughs> game recognized game, Grandpa. And it says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such the like. So you have all of these people outside of your church and that's a wall. Now, inside your church, you got some more walls with all these other different things that's going on uh, in the spirit and in the mind and in the body and on the, in the heart of the congregants that's coming to fellowship. Now, you have this game player, which is, the, you know, the flesh man or the flesh woman. They got all these things going on, but they want to be delivered from it. They tired of committing adultery. They tired of sleeping around. They tired of, of, of indulging themselves in witchcraft. They want to find real answers. You know, now these works of the flesh people, they come in and here they're met with the same things that's outside of the church. It's in the side of the church. That's not good. A church without walls means that we have surrendered our lives to Christ and we are working in the fruits of the spirit. We are exhibiting the fruits of the spirit daily, not just on Sundays or on Easter or on uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, but every day of our lives, we're exhibiting fruits of the spirit. And the only way that those fruits of the spirit are going to manifest is, is, and come through in your life is when you're born again, that means that you accepted Christ as your savior. That means that you're not playing around no more and just going to church because this is the other we need you on Sunday or the pastor say come because we're going to wear black and white that day. Or, you know, we got a program that uh, this group is going to come to sing. We're coming because we're coming to be recharged and renewed in our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the accountability that the pastor does. That's the accountability that he brings to the fellowship because so the pastor goes, that's how the congregation goes. So that's important. That's why the apostles had to, the, were accountable. That's where the accountability comes at. Nobody should have to look into inside your house and find out what you're doing. And nobody should be uh, telling you on the telephone, hey, get your house in order. Nobody should be trying to manhandle and strong arm your house and everybody else's house in the congregation. That's not the leader's job. That's not even assistant leader. That's not even the third, fourth leader. That's not nobody in leadership because everyone has to give an account and if we love each other the way we're supposed to love, and if we have a copy love for each other, then we don't have to do all those things. We don't have to go and be, I spy for the pastor or, you know, the house mouse for the pastor and going back, telling him what Sue Sally did and who did what yesterday and all that. Mm -mm. We got to get out of that because a church without walls is going to have that that love suffers long and kind and love does not envy and love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up because those walls are down and we're able to show love to each other, regardless of what their situation and circumstances are. We are able to still meet them, greet them, love on them, pray for them and encourage them. That's when your walls are not up. That's when you don't have any walls. It don't matter how many buildings that you have and how many structures and how many seats that fill up a, 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 a 
a congregation or a church. It doesn't matter if you don't have love. If you don't have all of those things and, and that's residing within your congregation, within your fellowship. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, we everybody's going to have that. Because all churches and all fellowships are works in progress. So everybody's not going to be on that same level at the same time. But if we meet a meeting ground, a, 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 me, a middle ground, you know, where we can build a baseline of love, meaning we should always, each of us should remember where we came from and remember how we got there and remember what it took to deliver us from our situations, then that empathy, that Christ-like love, that agape love, that love should start to fill up inside of us to where we won't look at Joe Snuffy that comes through there that, you know, might have a dress on or look at uh, Mary Sue that comes in there that got pants on and they got a tie on. We won't look at them in a way that, oh, those are abominations. Or those are people that, that are mentally or, or physically something wrong with them. Instead, this is what we should have. And Galatians 5, 23 said, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such is no law. So these are the things, all of these are physical, are spiritual things, are, are mental things. All, all these things that, that we're talking about are the things that we can have changed and renewed and we can decrease those feelings and thoughts inside of our minds the way they used to think and the way we used to feel about us, uh, someone when they come through or come in our, our uh, establishment or even around us individually. You know, we should still be able to love on a person. They might be sinners, but you know what? They might not even know what sin is. So, you know, a lot of people, they, they throw the word around, you know, you're just a sinner, you sinning, or you're going to sin, you're going to die to go to hell. You know, a lot of people know what the word sin is, but they don't know what is sin. <laughs> so sometimes you have to talk to them. Sometimes you have to explain to them that according to the belief system that I have, according to the Bible that I study, and according to the faith that I live, these are the things that have told that I was told and I have read and I believe is uh, disobedience to God or rebellion against God's purpose for our lives or is what displeases the one true God. When we give them an explanation about it, because we can't assume that everybody know what sin is because just because we learn about it, that doesn't mean everybody know about it. I mean, yeah, you can look it up. Yeah, and it's Google. You could do those things, but when a person is walking in it, and they might not know that these things really, really uh, have an effect on where they're going to spend eternity. That's where the great commission comes in. That's where we're supposed to be the go people, therefore people, and, and let them know what's going on. Talk about Jesus saved, you know, because Jesus even did the same thing, you know, and, and then, you know, when he, um, when the disciples and everybody was there. And there's there are instances in the Bible where God had uh, said he could go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. Um, you know, and that's in the Bible what it says. But that was talking about a servant, a parable servant. Uh, I'm sorry, a parable about the, uh, the servant being told to go and compel people to come. But that was a parable that Jesus was talking about to uh, the people, you know, when he gave a parable in the Bible. He would go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come because there was a party going on and he had set up a banquet and he wanted people to come. 
That's what God wants us to do. If we're in an edifice and if we're in a, a service of worship every day and if, if on Sundays, we should go out into the hedges and highways and, and talk about Jesus. Talk about the goodness of the Lord. Talk about how he has made a way out of no way for us. We should not be at a place where we can't go individually and compel people to come find out who Jesus is to feast at the table of, of deliverance, to feast at the table of reconciliation, to feast at the table of redemption. So instead of us con considering ourselves to be saved, considering ourselves to be uh, you know, believers in Christ, well, it's more than just words. It has to be action. It has to be love actions that exhibits the fruits of the spirit, that exhibits, you know, the long suffering love and everything that comes with it. We must get to that place as believers that a church without walls, whether it's us individually or whether it's us as a, a fellowship, our walls have to be down when it comes down to loving others, our walls have to be down and, and we should have no restrictions to going to, and embracing someone and being there for them and loving on them. Even if there were once believers and they may have fell away from the gospel and they may feel like, you know, what's the sense of me going to church? What's the sense of me serving God? Or they were church hurt. And you know the people that have fallen away from church, but we like to call them backsliders and we like to call them sinners. And then we just wash our hands with them and say, well, you know, I've got to concentrate on me, you know, but God has always gave us the commission to go. And we have to maintain that throughout our walk with him. We can't give up on people when we know that they have turned away from him because the devil will come and steal people and kill people and destroy their faith because that's his job. But it's our job to help them to see, hey, God still loves you. No matter what you're going through, or no matter what trauma that you experience, whether it, it was physical, or emotional, or mental, that God still loves you. And we have to find a way through connecting with them in love and praying with them, keeping in touch with them, talking with them, you know, listening to them. Sometimes people just need a listening ear to give you an opportunity to say, well, I'm here because God sent me here to just love on you. I don't want to do nothing else. I don't want nothing from you. You ain't got, you know, I just want to love on you and let you know that God loves you and you're not alone. That makes a big difference to people that are hurting, those that are broken, those that are despondent. So I encourage you all, a church without walls is us. A church without walls is a, a complete building filled with fellowshippers that has no walls up in their hearts and in their minds and in their spirit about meeting the needs for others, about expressing love to those that are hurting, about reaching the lost at any cost. That's a church without walls. We don't have walls and elitism, and we don't have those thoughts of being the only one that is going to heaven because of our doctrine or because of our denomination, or because of what we read two or three scriptures and said, oh, it's just 144,000. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be one of those 144,000. No. God had said, he, he's, the, Jesus said he's coming back for a church, you know, and the church is those that believe and those that are are ready to receive those that have done the work on this earth, meaning that have loved, that have showed, that have followed the great commission and followed the great commandment up to the day that they die. You know, a lot of us, a lot of people are waiting on the rapture. Okay, I'm waiting to be caught up in the end, the Lord come back. But if you don't make it there, <laughs> you still have to have ran your race, fought the good fight, and kept the faith. And when it's time for you to lay down, 
to know and believe in faith that you've done all you could to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. That is to go and tell people about Jesus and to love them and to be there for them. So that concludes tonight what we wanted to discuss. I pray that um, that some someone has gotten something from it. And I'd like to open if if Dr. Marcel or, or Keisha would like to say something before we close. Uh, a lot this moment. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we're going to um, we're going to end today with a word of prayer. I pray again that that uh, something that we said has touched somebody's heart. And if you're listening to this in the future, uh, please know that everything that's said is said. I love that being a church without walls is a big responsibility. That meaning us as living examples of who Christ is, us being a body of believers is a big responsibility because we are the only Jesus that people may ever see. We are the only examples of true love and true faith that people may see. You don't even know that your neighbor is watching you go to church every Sunday, dress up, look like you you saved and sanctified and baptized with the, the Holy Spirit and, and, and burning fire. You look like that. But, you know, your walk is what they see. Your mannerism, your character, the, the joy that you have. Those are the things that they look at as well. How you handle situations when they come against you. Uh, are you saying the joy of the Lord is your strength? Or are you saying, man, I'm defeated. I can't do it. I, I don't know what else to do. Or are you saying, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me? See, when they start saying you smiling through your, advers ad uh, your adversity, when they start saying that, then they're going to want some of what you got. They're going to want to experience the joy of the Lord is your strength. How you get so strong when you're going through so much. Then you say, I, I'm just learning how to learn and trust Jesus. And I'm going to smile my way through it because like, like Keisha said earlier, if complaining ain't going, to do, ain't going to do no good. So, so we got to keep the faith, keep going, keep, keep walking, keep running. Keep proclaiming Jesus in all our situations. And that's how that wall never comes up against uh, other people to not be able to see the joy of the Lord in your life. That it's, just, you know, divided the division of not being able to see your faith in action and your faith in, in motion. You know, you, you want people to see those things because we are the, the vessels. We are the ambassadors of Christ. And we have to show those things. And we have to walk in that mannerism every day until we leave here. Until God says, you good and faithful servant, well done. So amen, amen. I thank you all for joining us. And God bless you all. And I don't want to leave without a word of prayer for those that are on the call and those that may listen in the future. I pray that God blesses you. I pray that God uh, touch and heal and provide whatever resources that you need. I pray that those things come forth. And I pray it's his will that those things come immediately. Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all things. We pray, Lord, that everything that we talked about tonight, it's a blessing to someone, that someone gets a word out of it or a nugget or something that they can go about their day encouraged and in faith, knowing that love is the main thing that we should show those that are hurting, those that are, are, are going through situations. We actually have Heavenly Father to give us love, give us kindness, give us peace to 
withstand situations that come up, knowing that you are with us, that you can do all things abundantly and exceedingly that we can ask or think. Lord, I ask you to touch the homes and the hearts of those that may hear this call or, or video it or, or be a part of it, Lord. We ask you to touch them, Father, and keep them in perfect peace. Lord, we, we know that the devil is out there to steal, kill, and destroy people's emotions and how they feel and what they think about life. But Lord, we ask you to reveal yourself, Lord. Let them know that death is not the answer. Let them know that drugs is not the answer. Let them know that evil is not the answer, but you is the answer. You loved us so much, Lord, that you gave your life, that we may have the eternal life, that we can be reconciled and redeemed back to our Father, the Creator. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, if it's your will, heal the hearts that's broken. Heal those that are going through situations and circumstances. If it's your will, Heavenly Father, bless those that need a blessing, that need a financial uplift, those that need encouragement, Heavenly Father. Send the encouragement. Send the finances. And Lord, bless those where they need and meet their needs. We ask you these things so humbly in your name, Jesus. We know it's not our will, but your will be done in all things and we trust you and we thank you and we believe and we walk in faith that you hear our cry and bless us according to your will in your name jesus we pray amen 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 Amen. so i'm gonna say good night to you all and i thank you all for joining us you know and um just please know that God loves all of us and God wants us to be living witnesses and examples no matter what. So try not to let your walls come up when the devil come against you. Please fight that because people are seeing your walk. People are loving on you and people want you to give them an answer that you have that made your life the way it is. So when they see you, they're seeing Christ. When they see you, they're seeing the fellowship that you go to every week. So it's important that we are living examples and witnesses of joy, love, peace, long-suffering, the fruits of the Spirit. And if you don't have an opportunity or you don't know how to have those things, you know, get into the Word of God. Pray. Seek Him. Seek Him. Ask God to reveal His Spirit in your life. And it on an individual level so that when you go going home at the end of the day or after church is over with, when you're going home, that the workings of the Holy Spirit is still working inside of you to change those things, to change those thoughts, to renew the, your mindset so that you can know and feel that the joy of the Lord really is your strength and you're not going to worry about anything. So I love you. God bless you. And I thank you all for joining us tonight. Don't forget to reach out to us on our website uh, or send us a text or or, or email. And we are more than happy to reach out to you. Our website is reflectionsofgraceoutreachministries.org. And you can listen to us on YouTube, Anchor Podcast, or even now you can find us on Facebook. <laughs> and my wife and I, we both uh, prayed about it and we now have a Facebook page. You know, mine is Reflections, of, ours is Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries. And you can find both of us there. And my wife, she has an inspirational page, which is oh, dynamic. It is wonderful. Easily listening and it's very soft and soothing. It's called Denise's Inspirational Melodies. Each of the, the uh, each of the writings and, and the, the voices are so soothing for just those days when you just had a rough day. Just just go to that and, and she has a, a podcast and she has uh, a YouTube channel as well. So don't forget 
Denise's Inspirational Melodies and Reflections of Grace Outreach Ministries. So please feel free to reach out to us and subscribe or like or whichever way you would you do or follow. Uh, we love you and we thank you. And you all have a good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>